welcome to my talk. Thank you for so many showing up here. I hope you will not be <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> Who of you have been uh, using EMF? Okay, that's good, because <laughs> otherwise you won't understand anything. Who of you have been using EMF for more than five years? Okay, you might be bored. <laughs> Has anyone been using EMF since the start, like almost 10 years? Okay, <laughs> you might be very bored, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is your chance to get away. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my name is Maximilian. I work for Eclipse Source and uh, in Munich we do a lot of modeling and the things that I try to compile is of course not a complete list of what you should do or should not do but these are things that I often see at our customers or even in our own code that go wrong. And the general idea that this talk is following, EMF is very powerful but with any powerful thing it can happen that you do something little wrong and it really goes wrong very badly. Uh, this is a nice site. Um, the first 90% of the code accounts for the first 90% of the development time, but unfortunately the remaining 10% of the code account for another 90% of the development time. <laughs> and this is basically what happens with EMF, at least sometimes, if you uh, don't respect some, some of the things. Um, all the examples that I have follow a very simple ECOR model. I just chose that for the sake of having an exi a simple example. Um, I have an entity player. The player has a name and it has a Boolean flag whether it's a professional player or not. And in a game there can be one or zero players and the game has some frames which are, it's a list of integer and it also has a professional flag. So this is a model that, that we're going to use uh, throughout the different examples. Uh, another warning about the examples, the examples are, there's no good transition between the examples. I thought about having a good transition, but it's really hard. They're from very different domains. So they will just drop in one after another. I have 10 examples and uh, 10 things that you should avoid or should do when using EMF. So let's dive into the first one. Um, this is a problem that you encounter. So the problem that you encounter is, you have a game, and this game is stored into a resource. Let's imagine it's an XMI resource. You store it into that resource, and then you reload the resource. And now something strange happens. The problem is that suddenly the game changes the professional attribute. And it only, after some debugging, you find out it only changes the professional attribute if this game points to a professional player, which makes it even more odd. So what's wrong? I mean, it shouldn't happen. If you serialize something and deserialize it again, then you probably expect that the deserialized stuff is exactly the same as the serialized stuff. And while looking into that, you find some custom code. You find some custom code, custom code in the set player method. And if you look at that custom code, I've marked it in in yellow here, you see that someone added an if statement. So if this code is, by the way, in the game. So if the game has a player being set here and that player is a professional player, then the game is also turned into a professional game, which might make sense because if you add professional players to a game, maybe the game is a professional game. The problem with that code now is that this code will be called at a time where you don't want it to be called. It will be called if you set the player somewhere in your, in your uh, application but it will also be called by a number of other frameworks, such as the EMF core framework about resources. If you deserialize a resource, every setter in your domain model will be called. And now if this setter is being called on deserialization, you sure don't want your model to change during the set. Um, the same problem is true for other EMF-based frameworks. They rely on your code not being changed in a way that has these side effects. So if you use Tineo, or if you use CDO, or if you use EMF Store, or even if you use some of the uh, UI frameworks, you might run into these kinds of problems. So the general advice is you should avoid these unexpected side effects and just don't change the generated setters and getters. In general, there is use cases where you do it, but you have to carefully think about doing that. Um, 
And there is other places where you can customize this kind of behavior. So you could also customize that in, in the respective commands, which is for most cases maybe a better idea than, than doing it there. Example number two, um, again a problem that you encounter. Um, you assign players to a new game. So you tell the game, hey, this is your player. And suddenly the players are lost in the new game. If we uh, look back at this slide, if we look at that model, it's a, it's a normal cross-reference. So it should be able, the player should be able to be pointed by many games. So many different games could contain the same player, in theory. Yet we run into this problem that now we assign, when, whenever we assign a player to a new game, then suddenly it is lost in the old game. And the cause for that can be that you have the following code snippet where the code is marked with generated not. Now if you mark code with generated not, the, the generator will no longer change it. And if over the time in your model, for example, the containment property changed, then the code will not be adapted. So now suddenly the player that you have here is contained in the game. And if it's contained in the game, then it can only be contained in at most one game. So if you assign it to a new game, then suddenly it changes the container. The old game loses it and the new game gains the player. And if you look in your eCore, you can't see that because in the eCore it's, it's all fine. It's a normal cross-reference. But the problem that you have is you did not, you, you added generated not to one of the, uh, to, to the generated code and during regeneration, this piece of code stayed in there. So it is an e-object containment list and not an e-object resolving e-list. Basically it will then behave the way it does, but you don't want it to do it, to do that way. The general advice here is there is a, a pattern to do these kinds of things. What you do is you post fix the method with gen and you leave it at generated. So this is now the, exactly the generated code for the set player. And if you want to customize that, you create a second method that is called set player. And in that method, you do some custom code and eventually you will also call set player gen. If you do it this way, then the generated code will still be updated by the generator. So when you change some of the properties in your eCore, they will be reflected in your code while you can still have custom code. Remember example number one, think about customizing that code, but if you do, please do it that way and use this pattern. It will uh, help you to, to keep your code updated. Another problem, um, which sounds kind of similar to, to what we saw in the first one, we have a non-professional player and we copy that non-professional player. And by copying it somehow gets reset to a professional player. So the copy works, but it doesn't work for a non-professional player because it's being reset to a professional player while copying. Maybe some of you can already imagine what happens. It's, again, it has something to do with changing the generated code. And this time what has been changed is in for every entity that you have, you have these generated factories. So we have a bowling factory for the players and it has a method, create player. And someone put something into that method for default initialization probably. And it sounds like a good idea at first. Okay, let's just set players to professional players. That's the default and uh, they're initialized correctly. The problem with that, again, similar to, to the don't number one is, these generated factories are widely used. So they are used by the EMF core framework, for example, for deserialization or for copying, such as in, in this case, and by the other EMF-based frameworks. And if you change the factory, it, it will, for example, be used during copying and you initialize something to a value that that it maybe wasn't in, in the original. So the changing of, of this uh, generated code again has some unwanted side effects and there is a way to get around this. Um, the, the most simple way is default values for these simple attributes. You can just set them in your eCore. So you go to your eCore and you can change the default value literal and for is professional, I just set it to true and that's fine. Then it is in, in the generated code. If you have 
because this also happens if you have more complicated default initializations. Let's imagine in the game there's always supposed to be a player and if you want to, if you want a new game, you want it initialized, then you should move that. Um, you can move it into a controller code uh, where you create these containment children. Um, another uh, way, an another place where it can uh, go to is you have these uh, children creation extenders in EMF. You can put the code into there, but you shouldn't put it into the generated factory. It will have bad side effects. Example number four. Um, I picked this for, for the EclipseCon uh, North America, where I held a similar talk. Uh, this is not specific to CDO, let me say that in advance. So CDO is a mature technology, uh, but it's a good example that even in things like that, something can go wrong that is, is related to another problem. So what happens is you fire up your CDO server, everything worked fine so far, but suddenly you get a null pointer exception at the start of your CDO server. And the last thing that you remember is you, you changed something in, in your model and you regenerated it, and now you get this NPE. Every time you just start up the server. And it turns out that quite some time ago, there was a bug in, in CDO with picking up sub packages. So in your eCore, you have your base package, you put in your entities, but you can put in sub packages. And it happened that CDO did not correctly pick up the sub packages in some more subtle context. It also had to do something with the naming as far as I remember, but it didn't work out. And this is something which might sound odd because it's everywhere in the tooling in EMF. You can do it easily in an eCore, add a sub package, but it's not a good idea. Just don't use the sub packages. Originally, they have been designed into eCore. It's very hard to take them out again, of course. Um, but even at Merck says that the sub packages are evil. With his new X core, he didn't even add the possibility to have sub packages. So, and, and there's many bugs and problems in, in all the EMF frameworks that relate to sub packages because it's just so easy to forget to also process the sub packages. So just don't use them because there is an easy way around that. You just use multiple E cores. So if you would have a sub package, just open up another e -core. It can even have the, if you think about the Java packages, it can even ha be a sub package in the generation of the original sub package, uh, of the original package, but you just put it into another e -core. It also makes your models uh, more modular and, and you have smaller model fragments, which I, I also like. Containment structure. Um, this is not, uh, this is out of, of the loop with, with all this having a problem. Containment structure is, is more something that, that turns into a problem later on, but the, it is very important for your data model to think about a proper containment structure. You probably encounter these kinds of problems. And the questions are questions of this kind. So maybe you have a model with a car, and in a car you have a motor, and a tire, and now the question is, is the motor or are the tires contained in the car? And this is really not simple to answer because it, it depends on your application domain. So if you're a car manufacturer and you sell a whole car, then I would say probably yes, because you don't want a motor without a car, and if you delete a car, which could correspond to destroy a car, probably the motor is gone as well. If you were a car repairer and you have motors lying around for, for cars, then probably the motor is not contained in the car. Because if, a, if, you delete a, uh, if you delete a car from your database, maybe you want to keep the motor because you, you, you can keep the motor on its own. It's a replacement part that you want to keep. So the, the advice is that you should really design your containment structure at an early point in time. You should think about which object belongs to which other object in the sense of when this object is copied, do I want to copy the contents of, these op of this other object? Um, do I want it to be deleted if the container is deleted? Um, the containment structure also has to do something with structuring your domain model in general. So um, you, should, you should avoid to have big flat collection of E objects, something like uh, yeah, just an array of E object, of type E object where you put in everything. It is not, it might not only be slow in, in an actual implementation, if you put it somewhere, it's also very difficult to visualize. 
It often helps if you provide your, your, the users of your domain model, if you provide them with some, point, some, some means to structure the domain model. So if you, for example, had users for a file system, you would obviously want to offer them folders because if you have folders, people will start putting stuff into folders. It gets easier to visualize and you have a, a nice containment structure. This is another problem that I unfortunately see very often. <laughs> it's an EMF-based application and people blame EMF for this problem. The application just gets slower and slower over time. You have to restart it eventually because it took all the memory or it just became very, very slow. You get these kinds of exceptions. Sometimes you open up something or you change something and suddenly you get a widget is disposed exception. And this is often a sign that there are adapters on the model, often adapters that notify some part of the UI and they are not being disposed correctly, at least not in all cases. So the reasons are that these adapters stay in memory, so they eat up memory. The application gets slow, of course, because all the adapters are notified on every change, although it doesn't even make sense anymore because the UI the adapter belong to is long disposed. You get the widget as disposed exceptions because the UI is already disposed and it still receives the notifications. And this sounds more easy than it is. I mean, make sure that adapters are disposed correctly. Yeah, um, but the only way to really make sure that this happens is you, you have to establish test cases for that. You have to establish test cases that use your, for example, your UI. You could use SWTBot that fires up the UI and it disposes the UI and then it checks whether the amount of adapters has increased. Because only then you can really make sure that you dispose all of, of all your uh, adapters. Uh, another way to introduce a lot of adapters that might get unused are the content and cross-reference adapters. Uh, a content adapter is a, a special adapter that will, if you attach it to some, something, it will attach to the whole containment structure underneath. So it installs a lot of adapters and of course this amplifies the problem. If you install a content adapter and forget to dispose of a content adapter, you will have a lot bigger, a bigger memory leak and, and it will get a lot slower. Undo. This is also something I often see that it doesn't work properly. You do something in your tool, you have a, it's a command, you do it, you run it, and then you undo the command. And unfortunately, the undo does not exactly match the execution of the command and therefore something is not completely undone. And um, the, the other, I mean, the other um, thing that, the, the other problem with that is of course, if you implement your undo manually, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to get it right and to have an undo that really cancels out the execution of the command in, in all the different cases. And there's a very simple mitigation uh, for that. You just don't implement the commands manually, you use the existing EMF commands. You can build compound commands out of these commands, but the good thing about the EMF commands is they are all, <coughs> <coughs> they are all undoable. So they have already an implemented undo functionality, it has been tested a lot, uh, and it's solid, it's very solid. <coughs> the, the other advantage if you use EMF commands is that it will also integrate <clears throat> better with other frameworks, especially if you need something like transactions. So if you use the transaction editing domain, for example, you have to use commands anyway. <clears throat> and uh, often it defines the granularity of changes for other frameworks also. Frameworks that, for example, track changes. They know if the command is over, then they can do something. So using commands in general is a good idea and using EMF commands in particular. <clears throat> the implementation is pretty straightforward for all the different kinds of commands. So if you want to add something to a reference, there's for example an add command, they, are, they have a factory method on the command interface. So you can call create there and you pass in a bunch of parameters, that typically the editing domain and the objects that are being changed, and then you can just run that command on the command stack. And on the command stack, if you call undo, the command will be undone as well. So it's really simple to use these commands. Um, another problem, um, you have a UI, 
maybe this widget here, and you have another thread in the background or you have a batch task and it updates some of the values in the model, but it's not reflected in the UI. The other thing that can happen is that you get widget as disposed exceptions because, uh, yeah, because you didn't use data binding or you implemented it in a buggy way. Um, if you want to bind something like that to your model, one way is if something changes in the model, you register an adapter to the model and every time it changes, you update that text field. And if you type something in the text field, you have a modify listener or whatever, and if it changes there, you write it back into the model. It's a lot of manual code. A lot of things can go wrong. You, again, you, you forget to dispose the adapters correctly if the UI is gone and so on. And um, also many special cases can be handled wrong. And this is where data binding is really useful. There's data binding for EMF. There's data binding for EMF and J phase and EMF and SWT. And uh, very new, there's also data binding for EMF and Java FX, for example. Um, so if you use that data binding, you avoid these updates problems in both directions. Basically, you bind your text field to a property in your model and it'll update. And even for more complicated stuff, there is data binding. If you have a list of things, there is data binding for that. Even if you have a table, there is support for data binding. And the data binding uses commands for undo and redo, which is, again, another advantage, so you don't have to do that. And it, of course, disposes adapter, adapters correctly, the adapters on the model and also on the UI. Um, how that looks like is also pretty simple. Um, first of all, we always we have the target, the target is the UI, and, and we have the model. And uh, first of all, we want an observable on the target, that is the text field, for example. And then you want an observable on the model. There you have the EMF added observable factory. You pass in some values that basic, basically specify what you want to bind. So for example, the structural feature. And then uh, you just bind the value on a so-called data binding context. So it's just three lines of code, but it really saves a lot of work. Deleting, it's also something that I uh, often encounter. Um, people start with small models and it all works well, but if models get bigger, suddenly deleting takes really exponential amounts of time to delete something from the model. And if you look into that, there's different ways to do it wrong. One way is, for example, you, you just use ecoutil delete. Um, if you look into the implementation, what ecoutil delete is doing it will, it will first of all um, detach the object from the containment tree. That's fine. It will get rid of all the outgoing uh, cross-references of that object. But the bad thing it has to do is it will search the entire resource set if someone is pointing to the object because it's very hard to find out, out if someone still points to the object. And searching the whole resource set obviously doesn't scale very well if you, if you have a larger model. Um, the problem is it's not that easy to replace. Um, there, there's two general extreme mitigations. One mitigation is you just make sure in your application logic that you don't that you either know all your incoming cross references by some domain specific rule that you have, or you just don't have any incoming cross references. So you try to maintain self-contained pieces of, of your model. You might even uh, have rules like, for example, in one res incoming cross-references can only be within resources or these kinds of rules. They can relax the problem. The other thing that you can do is, but it comes, of course, at some expense, you can use a cross-reference adapter. A cross-reference adapter is like a content adapter. If you register it onto an object, it'll register on all the contained objects on that object. But it has one difference, it'll maintain a cross-reference cache. So if you install that adapter onto your model or onto your resource or resource set, you can ask this adapter who is referencing object A. So what are the incoming references on object A, which can make a deletion, of course, a lot faster. But it has overhead if you change something, because then the adapters will have to maintain, then the cache will have to maintain, and it obviously wastes memory. But it is, in spending memory and some more time on changes, a way to, to, to get rid of the delete problem and make it a lot faster. Yeah, and finally, um, 
don't build on the generated editor. It's very simple with EMF. You start, you have your model, you generate your model plugin, you generate your edit plugin, and then you generate the editor plugin. Because it's already there and it's simple to use and you can uh, show people what your model can already do. But the editor is, even by the authors of this editor, it was meant as an example only. And there is, due to that nature, there's a number of problems we will encounter later on if you build on the, including questions? Okay. If you build on that uh, editor, um, there is no defined extensibility. So you will end up in writing custom code into the generated code of the editor. And then later on, if you switch to a new EMF version and the editor is slightly uh, generated differently, you will have to merge that somehow. And it's a nightmare. I have seen that so many times. You, you can't get away with that. It just won't work out on, on the long, ride, long run. There's no update strategy. No one will support you in doing that. So the, the, you can use it for prototyping, but you should then get rid of it. You can either use EMF, even maybe with EMF reflection, so with all the meta model information that you have to build a custom editor. Um, you could use other frameworks, such as the extended editing framework or EMF client platform to build uh, your own editor, but you should not build on, the, on this generated editor. It's very hard to, to get this updated. Um, where can you get more information about EMF? I personally, I like the EMF book. Um, if I have, even if I have some problem, I will look up stuff in that book. It's, it's not something from my point of view that you read through from, from start to end. It's something where you can have a look up reference. Another very good look up reference that I like to point out is the EMF news group. I think it's the best Eclipse news group. Um, Ed Merckx will answer any question with a probability of 99% within five hours or so. <laughs> and with a probability of 99%, the question has been asked before. So I would kindly ask you, search the news group. There is really an answer to any question you most probably will have. And if you have a question that you don't find there, you will get very quick answers. So this is, I think this is really the best resource that you can get about EMF. Um, another resource that I like to turn to is the EMF source code. Because if you, for example, if you ask yourself, why is EcoUtil so slow? You can just look into the source code and see what EcoUtil delete does. And the source code is very nicely structured, so it's quite simple to read from my point of view. And you can get insight from that as well. Um, all the EMF do's and don'ts and some additional um, I have also blogged about. Um, if you either use that URL, you just Google for it, you'll find it. And if you're interested about um, how do I build editors for EMF, I will uh, give another talk at 2.30 p.m. today uh, about modeling UIs. So how can I bind my domain model to some kind of UI? And how can I do that quite quickly so I don't have to use the generated editor? Okay, that's uh, it. I would like to take questions if you have any. Just go ahead. No questions. <laughs> it's not a good sign. <laughs> so if you like the talk, uh, please vote for the talk. You can do that online uh, on the program. And enjoy the conference. Thank you.